good evening and welcome tonight. Uh, our song will be 259 to begin with, 259, to God be the glory. <clears throat> Number 262, 262. Trust it never does. 
number 285. 285, and we invite you to stretch your legs and the choir will march back. 285, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed his name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me anywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me. prayer at this time. I'd like to ask Brother Dininger if he'll lead us, please. Thank you, Father, for the reassurance and the peace that we have in you, for knowing that no matter what we see here in this life or in this world, that uh, you care for us, Father, that you offer us redemption and hope, that you have been merciful and generous to us, and that you have filled us with lives of peace and prosperity. We thank you for this, Lord, and pray, Father, that we may be mindful and how we may use what you have given us to serve you, how we may reach out to others, and how we may have an open heart and mind to you and to your direction. Please be with Brother Mastin, with Saxon, with each of those that have physical or spiritual needs at this time. Help us to trust in you, Lord, and to do your will. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see each of you tonight. We'll be going to the book of John. And I think chapter 18 for our text reading. I want to thank everyone that had a part in supplying the abundant meal that was supplied for the family of Sandy and for the prayers that went up for the ministry. Saturday is a ladies' meeting, first one of the new year here at the church at 7 p.m. And then pray for the Sunday ministries radio broadcast as well as the regular services and brother Mastin we still uh, he's still hanging on so keep him in prayer for God's grace and I guess most of you heard about Saxon having a concussion and that's going to take him out of circulation for a while as he does the things necessary to get back again from that so keep him in your prayer and keep the family in prayer this is our 55th anniversary month, and uh, just threw out a suggestion to Rob tonight. You ladies might take it up and chew on it, uh, the ladies' meeting, but we didn't get to have a Christmas banquet, so I was thinking maybe we could tweak it and make it an anniversary banquet and uh, still have the time of 
fellowship together, the theme would just be a little different. So think about that and talk about it and pray about it. We'll see how things go. Let's pray for other churches and their ministries. So in John chapter 18, verse 38, John 18, 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now Pilate knew what was true. And so he said in the latter part of that verse, there's no fault in Christ. And in the 19th chapter in verse 4, he said the same thing, that <clears throat> I find no fault in him. In the 27th chapter of Matthew, when... Uh, Pilate is evaluating what is brought before him when the religious leaders brought Christ unto him. In the 27th chapter of Matthew in verse 18, it says he knew that for envy they had delivered him. So he, he knows the motive behind all of this. He knows that Christ is innocent. And then in verse 19, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. So I don't know how henpecked he was, but there was certainly some direct um, knowledge imparted to him in addition to what he already knew. Pilate, in verse 24, when he saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, he, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So he made a decision, and he took his position contrary to what he knew. He knew different than that. And so this definitely put him on the wrong side of Christ. I mean, there never was a meeting between the two of them, but let's just say there would have been a meeting after Christ's resurrection between Christ and Pilate. Pilate could not justify what he had done. There'd be no way that he could uh, explain to Christ what his decision had been. So Pilate, we know, will be judged for all eternity for what he did. So when it comes to truth, God tells us that uh, truth is something that was available before a lie was ever possible. You know, if you didn't have the truth, you couldn't have a lie. So here in Jeremiah chapter 9, and there in verse 8, it says, they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they're not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. That's a sad tale. That's a sad account. But yet, that's the way God saw it, and that's the way it is in the eyes of the Lord. So back to Pilate's statement again in John chapter 18, and there in verse 38, what is truth? Well, <clears throat> we know that that was not an inquiry. When he asked the question, what is truth, he wasn't really inquiring uh, as to what the truth was. But it's an attempt on his part to avoid the issue of what was really going on, to act as if there was enough uncertainty here to allow for his failure to take a stand. What prompted this, this um, reference to this passage? Uh, you know, sometimes things jump out at you, and they just really come across. But I was watching a news report, and a news organization was declaring themselves to be unbiased and to have integrity, to speak nothing but the truth. And one of the statements that they quoted, and this is the one that really came across, to be afraid to offend will prevent one from being able to speak the truth. Proverbs chapter 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, 
but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Pilate gave in to fear, as you see in chapter 19 and verse 8. So to be afraid of what someone's reaction will be will not only prevent us from speaking the truth, but it will also prevent us from taking our stand with the truth. And that's where Pilate was. Pilate put little value upon the truth. The truth is not where he placed his trust. And he was content to dismiss the matter by dodging the truth of the matter. In the second chapter of Acts, when Peter was preaching to the Jewish people about how things had transpired with Christ's crucifixion, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Pilate would have had a hard time listening to that because it was truly a wicked decision on his part when he gave Christ to be crucified. In the 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and there in verses 19 and 20, we read these words, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And notice that, ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. We often limit that to clean living. In other words, your body is a temple of God, so therefore you don't want to do things that would injure your health, uh, such as smoking, drinking, and all of that, and vaping, by the way. That's not a safe practice at all. But it is more than just about clean living. It's about ownership. It's about ownership. Who owns us? Well, the Bible says we're bought with a price. We're not our own. We belong to God. He owns us. So it's about God's claims upon us. It's about God's purpose for us. It's about God's calling and his election. It's about proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know, there was a glitch in Peter's thinking for a little bit when he got in with the wrong influence and the wrong crowd and he hadn't really prayed to not enter into temptation. And when the pressures came upon him, rather than I am not my own, Jesus bought me with a price. I owe my all to him. It rather was, I don't know him. You see how it worked? It worked that way with him. So we've got to watch and pray. Matthew 26, 41 tells us that we've got to watch and pray that we enter not into temptation because the spirit's willing, but there's the flesh. There's the flesh, and the flesh is weak. If we don't watch and pray, we can get ourselves in a position where it looks like we don't really know Jesus as a rightful owner of our life and what we're doing with our life. Now the consequences of that can be rather serious. Going back to 1 Kings chapter 13, 1 Kings 13, we all know the story of the prophet that God sent unto Jeroboam to reprove his uh, altars that he had built as being contrary to God. And Jeroboam reached out his hand to say, lay hold on him. But when he did, his hand dried up, and then he cried for mercy, and God granted him mercy and restored his hand. So the charge was that when you go there, you don't eat bread, you don't drink water, you don't turn again by the same way that you came. So uh, God owns you here. You belong to God in this, in this mission. Well, when he started back home again, in the 16th verse, 
there was another prophet. Uh, you know, sometimes we place too much emphasis upon what somebody else says they are. But here, he said, uh, this prophet said, come home with me and eat bread. And so the younger prophet said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Well, this prophet, this young prophet, yielded the ownership of his life to another person besides God. That's what he did. And, of course, there was a claim that that's okay with God. You know, God said this is okay. But it did not fit with the truth of God's word, which was you don't eat bread, you don't drink water, and you don't go back the same route that you came. So his mind was mixed up. And uh, if the only reference that we do with God's word is just refer to it, which he did, he referenced God's word, but he did not abide with it. And so things got pretty messed up. And so when we give the ownership of our thinking um, unto someone else, it can be very, very crucial for us. The only thing that kept Christ on track with God's plan and purpose, and I want to go to Luke chapter 22, and uh, you'll see what kept him on track with God's plan and God's purpose. And so we'll read in Luke chapter 22 and verse 39. Luke 22, 39. He came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. But from then on, he stayed on course with going to the cross. As a person, as an individual, we all are. You notice in verse 42 what his thinking was, I know the consequences of crucifixion. So, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. I know the consequences. And I know what other people are going to do to me. And in spite of all the personal pain and suffering and knowing what this would involve, he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. Nevertheless, thy will be done. So he had to come to that in order to become our Savior. If he had not got beyond what he felt and what he was feeling and what he knew the consequences of crucifixion were, if he had not got beyond that, he could not have went to the cross to become our Savior. But he laid all that aside, uh, just one thing in mind, Lord, not my will, thine be done. So 2 Corinthians 5.15, when it talks about our salvation, and it talks about the purpose that he has saved us, in 2 Corinthians 5.15, it says that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. That's the truth concerning why Jesus went to the cross to afford us salvation. He died to save us that we no longer live to ourselves, but rather we live to him. He is to be in full ownership of us. We must not 
deny Christ the ownership of what's rightfully his. We must not deny Christ the ownership of the talents he has given us to be put to use in his service. You know, Matthew 25 deals with that, about how that Christ, that uh, the master gave talents to certain people, and those that used their talents were rewarded, and the one that did not suffered great consequences. We must not deny the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we can function as a member of the body of Christ. That's the reason they're given in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Holy Spirit is given to us that we might be able to function as a member of the body of Christ. We must not deny that. We must not deny our indebtedness to the gospel. You know, somebody brought it to you. And we, therefore, are to take it to others. The Bible declares whosoever will, not just limited to ourselves, but whosoever <coughs> will. I want to read back in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, and there in verses 2 and 3, it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. There's a song that says, Will there be any stars in my crown? Think back on that. Who have you shared the gospel with to lead them unto Christ? Will there be any stars in our crown? We like to sing the song, what a day that will be. But what will that day be? You know, the day when we meet the Lord is when we're going to look him in the eye. He's going to look us in the eye, and we're going to give an account to him for what we have done with the salvation that he has given unto us. So what is truth? Well, Pilate asked that question. But when you think about what is truth, it is power. Truth is power. It is that which will endure forever. By the truth, all things were created. By the truth, this old universe will be destroyed, and a new heavens and a new earth will come to pass. By the truth, the work of redemption came to pass in spite of man's response. Pilate could say, well, I don't know what's true, what is truth, and he could do that all day but it did not interfere with God's plan of redemption. God's plan still came to pass. So even if the truth is denied, it will still come to pass because it is power. And of course, we all stand or fall by what we do with the truth. Faith in the truth is how we partake of the benefit of the truth. We had in our Bible reading this week about a centurion that had a sick servant, and uh, uh, he sent word to Christ. So when Christ was on his way, he said, I'm not worthy that you should come into my home. But he said, if you'll speak the word only, he said, my servant will be healed. And of course, Christ said, I haven't found so great faith in all of Israel. And so he spoke, and the man was healed. This may be the shortest sermon I've preached in a long time. But what is truth? What does truth mean to you tonight? What does it mean to me? It should mean everything unto us. And rather than to just ask the question, trying to dodge the issue, it ought to be an inquiry. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're thankful tonight that you have given us the truth. We know it's to be the lamp to our feet a light to our path, and we just pray that our thoughts would be such that it can be so, because we know that the Holy Spirit leads all who want to be led, and that is a wonderful thing, a wonderful experience, a wonderful blessing to have that into our lives. We know you've given us a whole Bible, and that Bible all speaks the same thing, of how important it is for us to acknowledge the truth not only in just the fact that you spoke it, and we know it's true, 
but to acknowledge it in terms on our end and receiving it by faith. We pray that your spirit would give the invitation, for it's in Jesus' name we offer a prayer.